Welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> so glad to see everybody tonight. <clears throat> I'm just going to open up with a couple scriptures that I found during prayer tonight as he was playing the wonderful worship music. Exodus 15 and 2 says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Is the Lord your strength tonight? Anybody need strength tonight? Yes. The Lord is my strength, and he's my song. And we're going to give back to him in song here in just a second. Isaiah 25 and 1 says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise and give thanks to your name, for you have done miraculous things, plans formed long, long ago, fulfilled with perfect faithfulness. He knew you were going to be here tonight. He knew what you were going to need. And he's... He, Anybody in here he's ever done a miracle for you? He's done miraculous things. So this says we're going to exalt him tonight. We're going to praise and give thanks to his name for he's done miraculous things. And he knew what you were going to need tonight. So worship with us in song before we um, get to the word tonight. We're going to worship in song. Sacrifice 
it's our time to give to the Lord. This is a form of worship. This is worship unto him. To give back to him first of what all he's, the part that belongs to him and then the part that you want to give from your heart. Lord, I ask that you bless this offering tonight, Jesus. Lord, everyone that gives tonight, Lord, I ask that you bless them. I ask, Lord God, that uh, for those that don't have a way to give, God, that you step in and you make a way, Lord. You provide a way, God, whether it be a job, Lord, or um, just whatever the circumstances are, God. We ask, Lord, that you do that in Jesus' name. And bless this offering, Lord, as it goes forth, God, to further your kingdom in your wonderful, precious name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. praise from our heart, not just from our lips. He deserves that that heart praise. And I'm so thankful that I'm in a room full of people that that's what you're doing tonight, because I can feel his presence. And he says he inhabits the praises of his people, so there's some real praising going on tonight. And I'm so thankful. Lord, we honor and bless your name tonight. Lord, we thank you, God, for coming and gathering with your people tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the lips of the of the man of God that's given the word tonight. We know the word's blessed already. And we ask God that 
you would anoint Seth as uh, Pastor Seth as he gives the word tonight. great to see everybody. I pray everybody's had a good week, and uh, it's always a privilege to worship the Lord. Amen. And uh, I have a, a study tonight. I've been doing some study lately, uh, trying to go in depth uh, in the Word, and uh, I've tried my best to uh, get outside of what I know and to challenge myself to uh, dig in deeper to get into the uh, to the meat of the word, Amen. I don't know if you've been paying attention much to the uh, to the news or what's been going on. There's been a lot going on, and uh, could I get just a little bit of monitor when you get done? I know you're doing great up there. Thank you, Devin, for all you do up there. I'm glad you start to feel a little bit better. But uh, you know, we've we've talked for years about uh, end time signs and. Uh, what's going to happen when the Lord comes back. And we've heard message after message after message on uh, end time prophecy and what's going to happen and this and that and all these different things. And uh, I had something sent to me the other day and I was reading into it. And I'm surprised that it uh, hasn't had more news coverage uh, than it has. You might have seen it. You might not. Uh, you know what? I'm not, I, I am, I'm, I'm not surprised that it didn't have much news coverage, but there was something that occurred uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was, let me make sure I get this right. There was a, uh, there's this thing called the Congress of Leaders of the World in Traditional Religions, and they meet every, uh, I believe, every three years. And this was uh, started and began back in 2003. And just a couple of weeks ago, they had this meeting. And uh, at this meeting, the Pope announced of this uh, this new conjoining of religions or whatever you want to call it. All the I don't know all the logistics of everything, but they call it Chrislam. And it, uh, uh, I say the word conjoining, but they, they say it's not a conjoining, whatever. But it's a joining uh, and understanding of of today's Christianity and today's Islam. And uh, one of the things that was said on me, I was reading an article about it, and uh, it it just tries to just throw off or whatever. One of the articles says, furthermore, although the Congress, uh, the Congress's outcome did result in a series of declarations, one of which made significant mention of the document on human fraternity, talking about religion, this did not involve a codification or ratification because A, the Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions is not a legislative organization, and B, the declaration merely states that the Congress recognizes the importance and value of the document of, on human fraternity for world peace and living together between Holy See and Al-Azhar uh, and Al-Sharif. In other words, they're saying that because they're not a real organization or legislative uh, Congress, that they, they can't make a ratification and, and a, a change to this, uh, this human fraternity, the religions, everything. But they're saying that they just recognize the importance of it. See, if you don't see that, that they're just wanting to swindle us, and for years, we've talked about one world government coming, and it's coming, and, and, and end time signs, the Lord's coming one day. But the signs are happening right now. See, they try to say, well, we're not a, a real, you know, legislative branch of Congress or whatever, and we can't make changes. But they're, they're, they're starting to just put their toes in the water and just see how the world reacts. It's here, folks. One world government we've all been talking about, they, they can ridicule whatever and say, well, we're not whatever, but it's, uh, it's here. And I was looking for a quote, and I found it right before, uh, right before church started. It was by uh, John Wesley, and it says, what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. You can count on it. What you tolerate and don't stand up against 
what you allow to come in your home, what you allow to come before your ears across the television or your phone or, or what your children's iPad or whatever these little do dolly things are nowadays, what you tolerate and allow to happen, your children and their children, and they're going to embrace it and do it because they think it's accepted, it's fine, nothing's wrong. So that's where we got to get our nose in the book and find out what's right and wrong so we can say, you know, you ain't supposed to do that. Right? Amen? So uh, things are happening. Things are happening. So I've got a, uh, a study I want to uh, just go over tonight. I don't have a title. We're just going to call it Bible study. That's what this is. I love Bible study. Amen. I love digging into the Word. <coughs> if you have your Bibles, then you can remain seated. I want to, uh, I want to read out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. I've been doing a study on this for some time, and uh, it, it, it uh, drew my attention, and I just dove into it, and I, I've been studying, trying to uh, understand and see, and, and open. I asked the Lord to open my understanding. Uh, so uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible is full of uh, uh, prophecy of end time and, and what's going to happen and what's some things that's not mentioned and some things that are mentioned. But uh, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, okay? So the, this is what's going on. This is Paul's book to the Thessalonians, okay? And he says in uh, verse 1, he says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So this is his subject. He, he just began, he opened up and says, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So everything after that, he's, this is his subject. He's talking about the coming of the Lord and the gathering of the saints unto the Lord. He says in verse 2 that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. He says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, we'll come back to this word just shortly, okay, and we're going to break this apart. He says, that who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. He's trying to remind them and, and tell them, hey, I didn't talk to you about this. You need to remember what I said. Verse 6, he says, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In other words, he's saying that there's something stopping uh, this son of perdition or this perdition to arise to full effect, okay? I think we could pretty well narrow that down as the hand of the Lord right now. It's not time yet. He's going to remove his hand when it's time and allow things to happen to the world, okay? He says uh, in verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. There we go. He's already saying how it's, how it's going to go down, how the Lord's going to triumph. Even him, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. He says, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie and that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. He's talking about a blatancy to, to push back truth, what's righteous, the word of God. Amen. I hope you've got your Bibles and a notepad as well. I've got a lot of scripture I want to share with you. I want to read now from, uh, from second Peter, and then we're going to come back and we're just going to break this stuff down. Second Peter chapter three and verse one. Second Peter chapter three and verse one, he says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Now this is Peter's uh, letter to the Christians abroad, 
in that in that time, okay? This is his letter. This is what's going on. Peter's writing to the Christians abroad in the area, okay? He says that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Remember in Thessalonians, he said, he said the Lord's not going to come back yet until there be a falling away first. I'm assuming that these scoffers and these people walking after their own lusts is a part of that falling away. Now think about it for a second. He's not, made, he's not talking about the world. Where's the, where's the world going to fall from? They're, they're where they've always been. He's talking about people who have tasted and have seen, who have climbed the top of the mountain to go commune with God, okay? He says there's going to be a falling away, a remission to where men who, who know and have knowledge of the Lord and who know what righteousness is and uh, the, the, the love of the truth has been open to them and available, and they blatantly deny it, Okay? That's what the falling away is. He's talking about people. He's talking about us. Talking about us in this room. Amen. He says, uh, verse 4, and saying, this is the scoffers and walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly, 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 are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out uh, of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. He's talking about the flood. But then, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, he's talking about the end time now. Now, in Thessalonians, Paul makes mention of verse 3, talking about the son of perdition. In this context, it appears he's talking about the Antichrist. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, that would come one day, that would attempt to reveal himself as God and would sit in the temple, uh, assuming that this temple is the, the next temple that they're talking about building now in, in Israel. Okay, they're talking about building this temple and making sacrifices back to God. And, and, and they, they didn't recognize that he came... 2,000 something years ago. They're still waiting for him to come. Well, he came already. Remember I told you the other day that the Jews thought that the Lord was going to come in this fiery uh, chariot of gold and silver that he was going to come and he was going to sit on a throne with the kings and the princes of that day, but he didn't. He came and he dwelled with the people that nobody else thought in, in no way, shape, form, or fashion that he was going to be with. And so they're thinking he, he still hasn't come yet. So they're, they're, they're abiding by Old Testament law that says you got to sacrifice, you got to make an atonement, you got to have this temple, and that's not good. So he's talking about this Antichrist that's going to come one day and it's going to profess himself to be God and is going to uh, ask worship of himself and, and, and ask others to bow down before him. Okay, now the word study of perdition has a lot of definitions, but the basic word study of perdition or a son of perdition uh, would be, here we go, you ready for this? A son of perdition is one that is in an unredeemable state, one who is damned to eternal punishment, one who, who is hopeless. There's no hope for him anymore. Okay? Now, the Bible doesn't speak of perdition very much. It just shows just a few verses when it talks about it. But Peter writes and concludes in verse 7 saying the, the, the perdition of ungodly men. He says but in verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire. Talking about how the Lord's going to rain fire on the earth at, in, the, in, the end, in the end of time. And, and everybody, it says in the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men implying here men, ungodly men, that there's more than one man. Now, most of the scriptures on perdition speaks of just one or just a, a man that would come, but Peter talked about ungodly men of perdition that would come forth, okay? And now the only way a man could be damned or, and in an unredeemable state, because I, I looked at this and I'm like, well, no, Lord, because everybody's got hope, right? And then the Lord started kind of talking to me and said, anybody, the only way a man can be damned or in an unredeemable state 
to where he's hopeless is to have his mind made up to such a point against God and against the necessity of salvation and what is in the word of God that he becomes immovable and unpersuadable. Right? You could tell me all day long that Jesus came and, and, and he died for me and everything, but if, but if I'm not willing to accept that, if I'm not willing to, to do what's necessary to obtain, the, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, to receive the Holy Ghost, and, and I stay, oh, I, I, I'm not going to do it. I don't believe I have to do that. I don't believe I have to be baptized. I don't believe i got to come to church. And I'm just, I'm, I'm set. Well, guess what? I'm a man of perdition. I'm lost. I'm hopeless if I don't accept it. This is all we have. If you deny that, you're, you're unredeemable. You're, you're, you can't, God can't do nothing with you if your mind's set, if it's fixed on what you want to do and how you want to do it and, 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 and interpreting the word and reading it like you want to interpret it, right? Now, we're going to keep opening this up in a second, okay? Now, John chapter 17 and verse 1 this is Jesus, and he's praying. It says in verse 1, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now I want to add this in here because sometimes it's confusing whenever you're studying the scripture and you're trying to figure out because you've got people that say there's a trinity and you've got people that say there's two and then you've got people that say there's an unlimited amount of gods and then you've got people that say, no, there's just one God. Amen. Well, the Bible says that there's only one God. All right, That's, there's only one. And any time you read where it says, makes mention of uh God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ or God the Father and the Son Jesus Christ. Remember that the word and is a conjunction word joining two thoughts together. It's saying anytime it talks about God the Father and the Son, it's saying that God is both of those. He's God the Father, he's the Son, he's the Holy Ghost, all of these together. It's, it's implying all the areas of, that he has impacted man. He's the father of creation. He spoke the, uh, the word into existence. He robed himself in flesh. He came and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the, the only begotten of the father. John 1. He died. He was raised up on the cross, and then he came back three days later. He showed himself among men, and then he said, go wait until you be endued with power. And then Acts 2, the Holy Ghost fell. He came back as the Spirit. The Spirit of God fell on them. So anytime you read the Scripture and it talks like, it's not saying that there's God the Father and then the Son Jesus Christ. It's saying that he's God the Father and the Son Jesus Christ. Okay? I just wanted to put that in there because sometimes that can be confusing whenever you're reading. And uh, and as a, it's joining two thoughts together. Okay? Anyway, that was a commercial. Now, back to our thought, I want to jump down to, uh, to verse 11. Now, Jesus is praying here, okay? He says in verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Uh, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. It, it helps sometimes to just read just a little bit further. There's been so many religions that were created on one verse. And if they would have just read three more verses later, they would have got their answer. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, some scholars usually, they, they say that Jesus is speaking of Judas, the one that betrayed him uh, uh, for 30 pieces of silver. And this was prophesied in Psalm 41 and verse 9. You can write that down and read it later. That's the prophecy he's, he's referencing there. Now, by Peter's words given, okay, in our text in 2 Peter, he describes that the judgment of fire from the Lord for the end time was reserved uh, for the perdition of ungodly men, okay? 
where, where present day Christianity comes in is where th there's so many beliefs uh, of one book, the word of God, and those uh, who don't believe at all uh, that are so set in their mind frame that they will become unredeemable because their, their unwillingness to see past what they want to see. They're so stuck at looking how they want to look at it that they're not open to say, God, show me something in the word of God. Illuminate the word to my eyes. Uh, uh, it, there, there was times where Jesus walked with the disciples, and, and I'll just paraphrase because I'm going to butcher it anyway, but there was times where he says, you're not ready for me to tell you this yet. You're not ready. But then there were times I said he opened their understanding to his words. See, there's times to where we might study the word of God, and you're like, I might as well just throw a brick at my head because I'm not getting anywhere. But the, the, the way you're supposed to study is not just read the words on the page, but allow the word to read you. Right? Anytime you go to study, you want to say, God, open up my understanding. Open my mind. Give me a revelation, Lord. Show me something in the scripture. Illuminate it. Open up the dark crevices that, that, that your word, the truth of your word, the righteousness of it is hidden down where, where only a real follower is going to find, right? So, it, 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 you see, I don't, I don't want to be fixated just on a religious view or, or what's on the church sign or what we uh, name and claim or blab and grab or, or whatever kind of stuff or specific belief system or, or culture, okay? But but I want to have a Bible culture mind of frame. You know what I'm saying? Frame of mind, excuse me. I want to, I want, I want my mind, the culture of my mind to, to be influenced by the Bible, not religious uh, uh, expectancy or importance on, on a specific subject or something, I want my mind to be affected by the culture of the word of God, the power of it, the truth of it, and the righteousness of it. See, it's not a matter of who we identify, identify with. It's a matter of choosing the unaltered word of God rather than the word of God that has been altered by man. Right? Because most of the time, Churches, religions, whatever you want to call it, they, they tailor the word. They tailor the word to how they want it. I don't want to do that. I don't want, I don't want what comes before this sacred desk or into this, this mind of mine to be altered by any type of religion, by any type of concept that's not God's. Right? We talked uh, some the other week about about the seven churches of Asia Minor that John wrote to uh, from the Lord in Revelation, okay? And uh, in this, in Revelation, the first few chapters, John has been exiled. He's imprisoned uh, on uh, Patmos, an island. And John wrote to them, quote, as a companion in tribulation. He didn't write for them as God's cop. He wrote to them saying uh, exactly what the Lord wanted him to say, but he says, I, I, I'm writing to you as a companion in tribulation to these churches who were in the time of tribulation from the government and the officials of that time, okay? So his messages to these churches served as a warning uh, that they should fear uh, any type of compromise. Rather, they should fear that more than fear of those who could kill them or take them away or break the church up or come in and arrest everybody and imprison them. He says, you, you, you ought to fear more compromising, doing something different to the word of God, doing something that you want to do to the word of God, taking away, adding to, doing what because... It, you see, it... it in that time, and I'll get to this in just a minute too, in that time, the, the, the government at that time was, was after them, was after the Jesus people that was still talking about Jesus. And see, if they just tweaked what they had been doing just a little bit, just, just stop talking about Jesus. Do your stuff or whatever, talk to people in, hid, in secret or whatever, but in open, don't, don't, don't say that name because that, that draws attention to you, right? But if they change that, that's compromise, right? And God doesn't like compromise, especially in his word. He doesn't tolerate compromise in his word. It's set in stone. It's spoken. It's, it's written. It's done. It's settled in heaven and in earth. So one of the churches he writes to is the church of Philadelphia. 
and this writing to this church is also symbolic uh, for the modern day church such as us and I'll show you why in just a minute in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8 I believe in the verse before he says write into the church of Philadelphia and then he, he goes this is what he starts writing in verse 8 he says I know thy works Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. He's talking about the ones that are Jews, but are, are not after Jesus, who have compromised, who have fallen uh, their will has fallen to the government to do what they want to do. They're Jews, but he says, you're not a real Jew because I came for you. I came for the Jews first. They denied me. So he says, but do lie. He says, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. He says in verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Here we go. He says, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, he's talking about the temptation that's going to come at the end of time, right, right at the time of the rapture of the church. Okay, that's why he says it, it's the hour, it's, it is the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. It's the time where he says, remember in, in our first text, he says, uh, him that leth will let, talking about the one that will remove his hand and things will begin to happen. The Lord is going to remove what, what hand he has on the world so these things can begin to take place. He's got it all planned out. Okay? And so he's talking about this hour of temptation which is going to come upon all the world, not just a section, not this. So he's talking about, he's implying about the end of time when the Lord's fixing to come back, okay? So he commends, uh, excuse me, let me finish verse 11. He says, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So he commends the church for two reasons, the church of Philadelphia. One, they had kept his word, he said, because the government was pressuring them to fall to their, to their law rather than the law of God, right? So they had kept his word. And, and the second reason is they did not deny his name because I mentioned just a minute ago that the, the government didn't want to hear anything to do with Jesus. They didn't want nothing to do with Even in Acts, after the Holy Ghost fell and thousands were converted, we've all read a few cha chapters in Acts. After the Holy Ghost fell and thousands were converted and many of the apostles went and preached and taught and, and, and miracle signs and wonders took place, even then, after some of the apostles began teaching or preaching in a certain area, the, 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 the works of Jesus, they were thrown in prison. Go read about it. Even then, after the Lord had done many wondrous works. So you see the 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 predicament they're in. In other words, it's like, okay, the government comes down, the United States, the president, and he says, anybody preaching Jesus is going to get locked up. And he commended them. He says, because one, you've kept my word, and two, you haven't denied my name. You haven't stopped preaching it. You had not stopped talking about it. You didn't start doing stuff different. You're still baptizing like I told you to baptize. You're still receiving the Holy Ghost and conducting a, 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 an atmosphere with the Lord like I taught you to do it. You haven't compromised in that area. So he commends them for that. They continued in his word. They didn't cease to do all in his name despite the pressure that was being applied by the powers that be that they were facing. Now remember he said in Psalm 119, and 105, he says, thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto my path. And Colossians chapter 3 and 17, I hope I'm not going too fast. Colossians 3 and 17, he says, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Do it all in his name. He didn't say do some things. He said do it all in his name. Everything you do, do it all. So it's implied that the the bigger uh, of challenges that we're going to face and are facing right now is the concealment of the word of God and to do all 
in the name of Jesus that we do. Because you've got to realize that if we attempt to do anything in ourselves, in our own will, in our own thinking, in our own concepts, uh, that we've excluded ourselves from him and now we're operating outside of his name. Right? I hope this is okay. This is something that's coming up. I mean, I'd be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed because this is, I mean, this is stuff that we're fixing to face and are facing right now. You know, we, we don't want to compromise anything. We don't want to compromise his word. We don't want to compromise in what we do in, in his name, right? So we got to be careful because I anything we do, we operate. We make a decision out of the will of God because we didn't, we didn't go talk to the Lord about it. That's in your own will. You just compromised. He commended the church of Philadelphia because they didn't compromise or deny his name. They didn't change his word. They kept his word. So he commended them for that. So I, I think because it's written in his word, I think we might need to pay attention. In fact, a couple verses down, he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Put it to your memory. Listen to what's going on because you, you, you might face this same thing. You need to keep his word. You don't need to deny his name, right? Remember Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 33, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. That's the real deal stuff there. I don't want to end up anywhere that's, that where people who have denied him. So the, the, the biggest battle we face today, uh, referencing back to the perdition, the unredeemable state to where people in their minds are so fixated that the Lord can't do nothing for them. You got to think about that be, be, because it seems that it's, they're not totally in a state of, of, of unredemption. But if someone is fixated so much to the point to where they're immovable, you can't persuade them, there's no hope for them. They've got to change their mind. They've got to change. They've got to turn themselves around. They've got to open up their understanding and their mind for, for them to be changed, right? I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. I want nothing to do with that. So the biggest battle we're going to face today and will continue to be the biggest battle is against ourselves, against the flesh, against the desires of our flesh. Because my flesh doesn't want to come to church sometimes. My flesh doesn't want to pray. My flesh doesn't want to do things. And, and if I let my flesh start to take over, I'm going to start doing stuff wrong. Now, Revelation chapter 10 it's a good study. It was opening my eyes a lot when I was studying this. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 8. Hope you're writing these down. Now, this part, uh, this is part of the vision that the Lord was, was showing John while he was in prison on Patmos, okay, uh, while he was in the spirit, okay. It says, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And it says, And I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. He says, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So the book described here is symbolic as the word of God, okay? Now that's easily understood because at the end of it, the last verse he says, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So this is a vision. It's not necessarily happening physically, okay? The Lord's showing them this in a vision, okay? So he took that little book and it's symbolic as the word of God because the Lord shows him that you're gonna go prophesy again. You're gonna take this word. You're gonna speak it to nation kings and, and uh, the different tongues, okay? And it said that it would be sweet in his mouth in the mouth as, as honey, but bitter to the stomach, to the stomach. And this is because, and I did some study on this also, because the word of God will always be sweet to our spirit. It'll always be sweet. When you're sitting here on Sunday morning and the word's being preached to you, or on Wednesday night and the word's being preached, your spirit likes it. Your spirit likes it. It does. What doesn't like it is your flesh. That's why he said, when I ate it, my belly was bitter. Because your flesh is never going to like the word of God. 
Your spirit does, but not your flesh. The flesh is what you fight every day. Your flesh is what you fight to not curse, to not lust, to not covet, to not be jealous, to not envy, not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, right? Those are the things that the flesh wants to do, right? So your flesh is always going to batter and battle against the word of God. Always. Your spirit's going to like what the words are. Now, David describes it in Psalms chapter 19 and verse 9. <clears throat> he says, and the, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Here we go. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now listen to Ezekiel's account at this same thing. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 8. The Lord speaking to Ezekiel. He says, but thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Talking about the rebellious Israel. He says, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. Talking about these words. Eat this word up, okay? He says, So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So the word's always going to be sweet to our spirit, right? It's always going to taste good when it's coming into our spirit. But what's going to fight the word is our flesh. What's going to fight the name of Jesus is your flesh. What's going to fight to keep his word is your flesh. Right? And so when we put all this together, this son of perdition stuff to where you're unredeemable, where your mind's fixated on what you want to do and how, I don't want my mind to be so fixated on what I know right now in my present time because there may be stuff that, that I know, there's stuff that I don't know. There may be things in the word of God to change my opinion of certain scriptures, but I haven't found them yet. And if I remain steadfast and, and, and just fixated to where I'm, I'm not moving. I, I'm set, right? I believe that you ought to do this and you ought not to do this and, and you need to do this to go to heaven and you don't need to do this to go to heaven. I don't know. I want to keep an open mind to the word of God. I want to be able to keep his word, right? I don't want to, ooh, I don't want to get into that area. So if you ask for a key to survive through whatever may occur to us in this time until the Lord returns. I believe the key is the word of God itself because the word reinforces the power of his name. The word reinforces uh, several importances. It reinforces the need for the Holy Ghost actively working in us. It reinforces the need for the word, right? So if I get in the word, I can keep his name. I can do all I do in, in his name if I'm under, understanding correctly and I'm, I'm keeping my nose in the word, right? So he used the prophet Hosea, and then I'll come to close in just a minute. He used the prophet Hosea here uh, to talk to the rebellious Israelites, okay? And uh, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, the, the Lord was speaking through Hosea. He says, my people are destroyed for what? For a lack of knowledge. You'll get it up in just a minute. It's Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 through 7. It says, for my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. There's a difference. They just didn't have knowledge because it wasn't provided them. He says, you're destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge. And when you reject the knowledge of God, when you reject that, what you going to do now? Right? Lord can't reach you if you reject him. 
if you reject new understanding, if you reject new vision, if you reject new revelation. That's why you got to be careful. If you've been coming here for, I'd say about three to four years, if you've been living for God for about three to four years now and, and so on, it's not going to stop. Even those who've been here for 15, 20, 35, whoever has been raised in all this, you, you, you've probably experienced or are experiencing now uh, a, uh, how should I say this, a uh, you're stuck in the motions kind of spirit. You come to church, we sing three songs, we take up offering, we hear preaching, we go home. Next Wednesday, if I show up, uh, we come in, uh, long week at work as usual, and uh, might have got to prayer, might not have got to prayer, here to preach and sing three songs, take up offering. Uh, every now and then they'll, they'll prompt us to come, let's come on up to the altar, let's push chairs back, let's get an audience with the Lord, and we go, oh, God, here we go. And then we come up here and we might pray just a little bit. We might, oh, God, we might even cry just a little bit. We might let our emotions get a little frazzled, dazzled, you know what I'm saying? And then we go home right? So that's a place to where you're stuck in knowing what you know. You're stuck. You're not going beyond. Not because you don't have the resources. See, we got to be careful. See, we might not blatantly say, God, I'm not going any further. Be yet our actions say different. It says that. See, we don't think it says that because we, we wouldn't tell the Lord that. Right? I wouldn't tell the Lord that. I wouldn't. He's my Lord and Savior. I love him. But yet our actions, we come and we sit in the same old chair. Next, this coming Sunday, I wish everybody in the room would sit in a different chair. Boy, I'm setting you up for failure, sir. Brother Freeze is going to be preaching to us Sunday. So everybody's going to be tight-lipped because they sit in a new chair. Don't know how to worship on the left side of the sanctuary. I wish you'd sit in a new chair. I'm, I mean, I'm asking you, Sunday, will you sit in a new chair? Sit somewhere else. Sit, sit, sit on a different row. Let me put it that way. There we go. See, you almost had me there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You are used of the Lord. Bless you. I want you to sit on a different row. And preferably, I'm going to go even further. I wish you'd sit a little closer to the front. Because we know our guests ain't going to sit in the front. So if we hogging all the chairs in the back, are we making our guests feel welcome? No, we're not. So Sunday, what are we going to do Sunday? We're going to sit on a different row, right? We're going to sit on a different row closer to the front. Come on, Jesus. If you do it, I'm going to be proud. Oh, I'm going to be proud. I believe the Lord will honor it. I believe the Lord will honor it. Sister Mina, I believe the Lord will honor it. I believe he will. All right, let's not come tight-lipped because we're sitting on a different row either. All right? Lord have mercy. So if you've been coming for a couple years or you've been living for the Lord a couple years and you, you just feel stuck or you've noticed or maybe you're noticing now that I've mentioned it, we got to get out of what I know right now. that there's that there, See, we, we know there's more for us to know, but there, there's, there may not necessarily be a desire for us to know it. So when we do come to church, my prayer should be, God, illuminate the word to me. Give me a desire, not only to want to know your word, but to keep your word. Give me a desire. What's he say? Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be open. Right? Seek it, you're going to find it. So when you start asking, I heard a message preached one time, the audacity to ask, Warren. There's so many things that we could have in our lives, but we ain't ask God for it. We just ain't asked. Ain't been sincere. Ain't asked him for it. There's so much we could have in our lives, but yet we ain't asked for it. Right? So we've got to get to a place to where, God, show, show me what's in your word. Illuminate it to me. Give me a desire for it, Lord, and help me to keep it. Help me, help me to keep your law. Help me to keep your word. Help me to keep it constantly. Help me to be subjected to it, Lord. Help me to submit to your word. Amen? What's it say in James 4, I believe, verse 7? Submit to God, resist the devil, and then he's going to flee. The devil ain't going to flee if you ain't submitted to God. 
Because he ain't scared of you. He's scared of the God in you. Woo. Scared of the God. He's not scared of none of us who ain't got God. Ah. But it said to submit to God, then resist the devil. He's going to flee then, right? So, so we got we to gotta get that down, okay? He says, continuing in verse 7, then we're going to close in just a minute. Hosea 4 and verse 7. Hosea 4 and 7, it says, as they were increased. Oh, let me, let me finish verse 6. I didn't finish verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. He says, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, and I will also forget thy children. He says in verse 7, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, will I change their glory into shame. It's understandable why it seems at times that, that we just get by by the skin of our teeth because it keeps us humble. I hate it just as much as everybody else hates it. But it keeps us dependent on God. Because I think everybody would be guilty to some extent if everything just worked out, if God worked it out, if he took away the strain that hovers over us. Uh, because at some point, our trust would begin to be in ourselves and our own ability. Right? See, the, the Lord promised a lot in his word, but he didn't promise abundance. Remember, he promised daily bread, just what you need to get by. What you, just, just so you survive, just what you need, living by your means, right? Mm. Just what we need. So concluding here in Matthew chapter 24, it's awesome stuff. I've, I've been trying to do an extent study and, uh, in the book of Revelation, trying to find out what's going on in the world and, and trying to look at prophecy and everything that's going on and, and things that are coming up, trying to just, just decipher the word where I could share it with you and show you what I believe the Lord's showing us in his word. Amen. We got to be ready, right? Matthew 24 and verse 40, and we're just going to read, uh, let's read six verses. Yeah. Now, he's talking about this right here. He's referencing the end time, okay? He's referencing a time where the Lord is going to come back for his people, okay? It says, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. He says, two women shall be grinding at the mill and the one shall be taken and the other left. He says, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known and what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He says, therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. So we may be able to study the Word of God and he may illuminate to us and us get the revelation on, on revelation itself in the book and all the chapters and the beasts and the foreheads and the eyes and everything that goes on in revelation, a lot of, lot of material. But yeah, we, we really, we, we'll never be able to decipher exactly when the Lord's coming back. He says, no man knoweth the time. So that means we gotta be ready. We got to make sure that we haven't been caught in that three-year stretch or that 15-year stretch or that 20-year stretch to where, or that 10-year stretch to where we're, 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 we're here, but we're, we're, we're just kind of, we're in neutral. We just kind of coasting. We just kind of ease along, right? I'm talking to myself. I was, I grew up in this. It's easy for it to become old hat. Come in here, sing three songs, take up offer, do preaching, uh, pray for a couple people, yeah, 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 and then we go home, then we go eat, right? Same old thing, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. So if you're not careful, that same thing will happen. That's why when we come in here on Sunday morning at 930, we are praying that God would do something special, that God, that we're expecting God to do something different, right? I'm expecting God to do something this Sunday. I'm expecting healing to be in the house. In fact, I think it will. That's right. It's it's happening. It's happening in us. I want to open up my mind. And I, here, I want to open up my mind to where I'm not confining the healing of God because I, I, I'm thinking it's going to happen this way. 
Don't restrict God that way. God, whatever, however you want to do it, Lord, just heal me. I don't care how you do it. You might do it in a doctor's office. You might do it in a hotel room. You might do it while I'm driving to work. You might do it in my sleep. You might do it while I'm making a cheeseburger, eating a cheeseburger. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how he does it. But sometimes we have this frame of mind where we think, well, it's going to happen like this, and I pray it's going to happen, or I pray it's going to happen, I pray it's going to happen. And we're, 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 we're restraining the hands of the Lord. We need to open up our minds. Lord, do it however you want to do it. It's your will, your way. It's your healing anyway, God. Just please give it to me. You've pr you promised that you'd heal me if I asked for it. Right? So I want us to come in here Sunday with a different frame of mind. God's going to do something. God's going to speak a word. He's, gonna, he's got a word for me Sunday. I believe that. So we got to believe when we come into the church sanctuary that, that God has a word for me that day. I, because why do we come to church? What's your reason? We come to receive something to change or do, do something different, right? We're expecting something to happen because otherwise we wouldn't show up. We wouldn't come. But yet we find ourselves here and there's a longing, there's a, there's a drawing on us. And if we tap into that, I'm telling you, the Lord will not fail you. The Lord will not fail you. There, there, I said it the other week, there's a field, there, there's a field of promises of God that are unobtained because some haven't asked, some haven't sought, some haven't knocked. And let it never be said that we died and went to wherever we go up or down, whatever you want to call it, and we didn't receive it just because we didn't, we didn't want it enough to ask for it or to pray for it or to come to the altar and lift our hands or to bow our knee and pray at prayer time at 930 on Sunday or, or, or to ask a, a prayer request or have somebody pray for me, pray for somebody else, right? Oh, there's so much that the Lord wants to do for this, for this church right here. There's so much that God wants to do for us. I believe that. I believe that there's so many things the Lord wants to heal and do and liberate and set free and strengthen and comfort. We got to start expecting it. My last two verses, and I found this quite uh, impressive, whatever you want to call it. The Lord still impresses me, right? I've heard these scriptures thousands of times, but I don't ever want to let, let it get old. I don't ever want to let it get old when the preacher starts preaching on Acts 2. I don't ever want to let, let it get old when the preacher starts preaching. On, we need to start worshiping. We need to start praising. I'm hurrying. Verse 45, Matthew 24. Let's go to 44. I'm sorry. We'll read that again. He says, therefore, be y'all so ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man come. Then he asks a question. He says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler of his household to give them meat in due season. He says, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now, I know the Lord has challenged us and, and commanded us to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, which are one in the name. I don't need to say that. I know we were commanded to do the things, to go out, share the gospel, everything. But he said that who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the Lord hath made ruler of his household, of his household, to give them meat in due season? And I don't think he's talking about meat to eat as in food only. He says, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing, serving his household. That's why I know I harp on men all the time. But ladies, you, 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 you ought to back up your husband. We ought to be leading our families. You ought to be backing up your pastor. I say that if you're widowed or if you're not married or something like that, you need to back up your pastor. Your pastor's covering your home. Your pastor in prayer. And, and God has a covering especially placed on you. Don't think just because I'm not married, I ain't got a husband or, or I'm widowed or something like that, that the God don't has, have a covering over you. He does. It's your pastor. He covers you. He does. So, 
when the Lord comes back, I don't want to, what's he say? If, if we've saved the world, but yet we lose our own soul, excuse me, gain the world. I don't want the Lord to come back and I've served in this church for since I was born and yet I'm going to come, he's going to come back and he's going to find my family lost. I'd hate for that. You know that? I would. So we got to be ready. And that what he says, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the son of man cometh. Stand with me. Amen. This is a good study. We, we need to go back over these scriptures. I hope you wrote them down. Are you going to go back and listen to it? Good scriptures. We got to be ready. I don't want uh, I don't want my opinion or what I know or don't know to uh, mess me up. Okay, I want to be open. All right, I want God to bless us. I want God to liberate us and and open up our understanding. And I want it just to just to whew, boom. I want it to just bomb fly. Ain't it right, Jose? I want it to just open up in my mind. I want all things to happen that I didn't think could happen. Amen. I know it can. So what are we going to do Sunday? Sit in a different row. And we're going to, right, and we're going to come expecting something special to happen, right? Isn't that right, Warren? I believe it with you. Sunday, something's going to happen. Sunday, something's going to happen. I speak it right now in the name of Jesus as we pray. I want you to lift your hands right now, and we're going to pray. I want you to lift those needs up that you've got. If, if you're in, in need of healing or something, I want you to lift, lift it up to the Lord. Just visualize it. I'm lifting up to you, God. Lord, we love you and we give you praise and we give you honor. Lord, we're believing right now. We speak it in the name and the power of your name, Jesus. Uh, we speak it right now in this congregation over the people that are here and I speak it over the people that weren't able to come tonight, Lord. I speak it over the families and those who are gonna be here Sunday, Lord. I pray that there would be a spirit of healing in the house. I pray that there would be liberation in the house, Lord. I pray over our understanding and our minds that we, we, we wouldn't be confined and we wouldn't restrict your hands, Lord. I pray that you would just do a, a, a quick special work soon, Lord. I pray that you would just, just, just set your hand out into the world, Lord, and start pulling people in. You would put a draw on their spirits, Lord, that they couldn't quench. I pray you'd just, you'd push them into the church. I pray you'd push them into your word. I pray you'd push them in the Holy Ghost. I pray that this would happen and it will happen in Jesus' name. We, we declare it right now. Healing's gonna happen. Strength is gonna be received. Comfort is gonna be given out among us in Jesus' precious name we all pray. And everybody said in Jesus' name. I believe that. I hope to see you Sunday. I pray to see you Sunday in a different row in a different chair for 9.30 prayer. Come to Sunday school. Invite somebody to church. Don't forget about our uh, peanut bowl on the 16th for pastor appreciation. And don't forget about our family and friends weekend and our plate sale on the 21st. 21st. I'll have the information out to you ASAP. God bless you. I love you. Have a good week.